Welcome back. We're on to part two of carbohydrates and foods. And we've been spending the past few weeks talking about structure and function of different macronutrients within food products. Uh, we had part one, which talked about the chemical structures of different carbohydrates and foods. And again, I'm teaching at Niagara College into a uh, chemistry program that's really focused on training students for product development and quality assurance type roles. And as such, the chemistry is not as in-depth as you might see in some pure chemistry or biochemistry type programs. And that's okay, because honestly, many of the students in this program haven't taken chemistry in years, or maybe they never even took high school chemistry. And so I want to make it really approachable, and I want to encourage people to keep on learning as they go through. Today we're going to talk more about function of carbohydrates. And at the end of this video, you'll be able to define the behavior of sugars and starches in foods. You'll be able to differentiate between Miller browning, enzymatic browning, and caramelization. We'll describe the starch gelation cycle and determine analytical methods used for starch functionality. A lot of the uh, history of carbohydrate analysis really comes down to the fact that we were doing uh, proximate analysis for many, many years. Proximate analysis just implies that first off, you measure the moisture content in the food product. You then measure the ash content of the food product. You measure the protein by combustion. So, pardon me, um, oftentimes that will be Dumas or Lico type um, or potentially even Keldal. Keldal is still done um, in a few labs. So you've got moisture, uh, ash, protein. You do fat by soxlet, in essence, just percolating it with uh, hexane or ether to pull the fat out. And the assumption was everything that was left was considered carbohydrate. And that's, it's really fascinating because we're not actually measuring carbohydrate. We're measuring everything else. And then carbohydrates, the assumed difference between the two. And even to date, that is how a lot of the uh, presentation is done uh, with respect to nutrition facts tables and so on. It's, it's really, really fascinating that that's the level of emphasis that has been done. Carbohydrate is such a complex um, analytical procedure that it makes more sense to subtract it rather than actually measure it. So let's jump into some functions. <laughs> Pardon me, I don't know why my nose is all, over, all of a sudden stuffing up. I'm not going to edit this out. I always joke we are friends at this point, and if you can't deal with me coughing or snuffling or sh changing slides in between then you haven't got the point of <laughs> the slides. I'm here to try and share some knowledge in a, in a useful format and not stress myself over too much editing. I would love to do more editing, but I couldn't make four or five videos a day if I spent all my time editing. Let's jump into some relative sweetness of sugars and sweeteners. And honestly, this is a fascinating space that product developers leverage. Um, Smaller molecule means more colligative properties, and we have a different slideshow that talks about colligative properties. So smaller molecules implies more colligative properties. Bigger molecules implies less colligative properties. And sugar is a very common um, ingredient to modify boiling point, water activity, um, osmotic pressure, and or freezing point depression. And so you think about this. Uh, compare sucrose to glucose. You can add... to. Uh, it, what we're seeing here, imagine you made uh, um, equal weight solutions. So let's say we had 10 grams of sucrose. Sucrose is always the base point in doing these sorts of tables. 10 grams of sucrose in 100 mils of water. And then you evaluated comparable sweetness profiles of other similar prepared um, solutions. So let's say 10, 10 grams of HFCS 42 in 100 mils water or 10 grams of honey in 100 mils water. These are going to be the relative sweetness profiles. 10 grams of lactose in 100 mils water, you've got approximately 16% uh, of the sweetness that you'd get from the same amount of sucrose. Um, what's interesting, glucose, for example, 74% invert sugar, you're only getting 50% of the sweetness gram for gram. So 
if you're thinking about colligative properties, invert sugar, one uh, gram for gram, you've got two uh, dissociation factor on your sugar. So you've got two particles gram for gram for the price of one. So more colligative properties. And you've got less sweetness. You could actually increase the amount twofold to get the same sweetness that you'd have from sucrose. You could have, in essence, four times the particles within that mass getting the same sweetness and applying so much more in terms of colligative properties within that system. You can see why uh, ice cream manufacturers have long used invert sugar as a, as a means of improving the functionality of their, of their product because one, invert sugar is not that expensive. Two, it's got great colligative properties and so you've got good freezing point depression without being overly, overpoweringly sweet within that ice cream mix. The fructose is interesting because oftentimes I've seen product developers come in and say, oh, you know what, I can use less grams of sugar and get the same sweetening power and they'll mix it into some baked goods or whatever. And fructose, as you remember from the previous slideshow, doesn't brown. It doesn't participate in the browning reactions because it's a ketose sugar. And so if browning is not part of the equation, fructose could be a really good way of getting gram for gram less sugar, but it doesn't participate in browning. And fructose has its own issues. Uh, most fructose is coming in the form of high fructose corn syrup. And as such, fructose has a bit of a um, bad reputation because high fructose corn syrup is seen as sort of a, a cheap ingredient by many people. And it's seen as highly processed and linked to genetic modification. And, and, and there's truth to that. It is a highly processed ingredient. Um, it's incredibly cost competitive against uh, cane sugar. And it provides a lot of sweetening power, gram for gram. And as such, many beverage manufacturers are using fructose because they're able to reduce the total calorie count on their ingredient declaration. So you could have a high fructose corn syrup, not 42%, but instead high fructose corn syrup, 95%, and label it as a high fructose corn syrup, but reduce your sugar concentration in that product and have a way lower calorie count, gram for gram. And we see that with certain beverage manufacturers. What else can sugar do? Well, it can participate in browning reactions. And we have two primary browning reactions that occur with sugars. First off, you can have caramelization, and that is sugar on sugar uh, browning, where we're taking the sugar and we are actually burning it. It goes through what's called pyrolysis. And while we're not burning it and you see flames and smoke coming out, you're breaking down the sugar into pyrolytic products, and those pyrolytic products are brown. In other cases, it is interacting with the amino acids within the food. So in the case of the bread, in the case of the meat, and to a lesser extent, the, uh, the vegetables here, it's interacting with the amino acids and creating mailered product. And I remember when I was in my undergrad, we had to sit and memorize all of the structures of mailered product. And I'm like, ah, you know what? You can look that up in a book. Um, <laughs> I want you to think from a product development perspective, when or what, what's, what's necessary for the conditions of mailered browning? So... In Mallory Browning, we need to have a reducing sugar and amino acids. And so we need it to be one of those aldose sugars. And it forms those brown pigments during heating. And in the case of caramelization, it is breakdown of sugars alone just from heat. Very, very high heat at that. Mallory Browning occurs at slightly lower heats. Something else that we can do with sugars. Um, in some cases, we are taking advantage of different enzymes to break down sugars. And we have talked about enzymes in a different slideshow. But uh, in the case of amylose, we can break down amylose to make free glucose using amylase. And a lot of people laugh saying, well, it's your, it's your enzyme, Amy. And I'm like, ah, oh, I, I don't own anything about amylose. But we take advantage of this alpha-1,4 um, cleavage in the in the fabrication of beer and other alcoholic beverages. We're taking malt, which has lots of starch, and we're breaking down the amylose starch into free glucose, which is a preferred fermentation substrate for yeast, and the yeast then produces the exometabolites of carbon dioxide and ethanol, which makes for tasty beverages. Yum. We also see amylose or amylase used also in the baking industry, and for certain yeasted uh, yeasted breads, we want a little bit of amylase in the dough 
as a as an adjunct to break apart the starch and that increases the fermentation rate because you got that free sugar that's available for participation um, consumption by the yeast or other fermentation organisms and that amylase can improve dough quality too much amylase though and you end up with a goopy and sticky and tacky sort of dough because the starch loses its integrity Another one, lactase. This is where we're breaking down lactose and the beta-1,4 bonds, freeing the lactose and glucose. And so this is common in some types of fluid milk, where we have reduced lactose milk for people who have um, dietary lactose intolerance. And in other cases, that lactase is inherent within the bacterial fermentation. So if you're making yogurts or cheeses, in many cases, the bacteria that's used for fermentation is naturally taking the lactase, the lactose. It's got lactase um, as part of its metabolism and is breaking down the lactose naturally. And so many, if not most, fermented milk products, yogurts, cheeses, um, etc., these are often lactose-free, but it's worth doing the validation to make sure that indeed you are able to make that label claim. Another one, glucose isomerase. This is very commonly used by the um, corn processing industry. So if they're, pardon me, taking corn and isolating out the starch, they can take the amylase enzyme, break the starch down into free glucose, take the free glucose, and then they can take glucose isomerase and make it into fructose. And as we just talked about a couple minutes ago, fructose has a higher sweetening capability than glucose gram for gram, and it's very, very popular within the um, beverage industry to use fructose syrups as a sweetening agent. So um, most of the soda pop manufacturers, um, carbonated beverages, they are very, very heavy users of high fructose corn syrup. Infertase is another fun one because you're taking uh, sucrose and you can break it down into free glucose and fructose. And this is, uh, pardon me, but it's the caramel secret. Um, in the case of many uh, ca uh, candies with fluid centers, some of them are filled as fluid centers. And in other cases, like uh, uh, candied cherries, they will take a fondant sugar so a sugar icing sort of base with a low amount of moisture content and it's got crystalline sucrose in it, put invertase in there and over time the invertase will break apart the sucrose into free glucose and fructose, leaving a sugar that doesn't readily crystallize. It's more difficult for glucose and fructose to crystallize than it is for sucrose. And so you can take that candied uh, cherry and uh, enrobe it in a liquid center by using invertase. And it's uh, kind of a neat thing to try out. Some chocolates are filled with a fluid center and um, by using precision depositing, they're able to then have a chocolate layer applied on top and that chocolate layer is able to seam to the, uh, the base layer of the chocolate but some of them are done by invertase, and that's a fun, fun enzyme. Let's jump into starch here. Starch, as we talked about in the previous structure, is a polymer, and we've got these nice long, long chains of alpha-1,4. Now, when I was in the previous slideshow, I was saying, oh, well, amylose packs flat. Well, actually, it's a long, flat helix. <laughs> I know that sounds like an oxymoron, uh, but... You can see this, it's, it's still a very linear pattern, but it actually is more of a helix type form. In the case of amylopectin, you've got these branched helices. Oops, pardon me, I want to jump back here. And what's, what's neat about these is that each plant that produces starch has a preference for the length of the chains that it wants to make. And so when it's packing starch into the endosperm, mo most starch is stored in seeds. 
And so it's stored in the endosperm, the starchy fraction of seeds. And it's in these starch granules. Now imagine the plant has the programming within it and says, I prefer to make my uh, amylose branches 100 glucose long. It will make 100 glucose and then it will make a branch point. Every plant programs differently and it has a preference for the length of branch branch chain that it's going to create and the and a ratio of how much amylose to amylopectin it's going to create. And what we see in different foods is these uh, granules of starch and they almost look like onions where we've got these layering structures and Every time we see a new layer, that's where we see a tendency of a lot of these branch chains to be occurring. And so it forms this layering in terms of the crystalline structure of the starch. So different plants make different starches. And this is, this is actually something that um, many product developers take advantage of. That you can do microscopy of starches and you can, um, you can both take pure starches and take a look under a microscope to find out more about the structures that you see. Um, secondly, you can see similar size granules. Some granules are extremely round. I'm going to bet that this, uh, I, this, this slide deck is so old that I can't even remember, but I'm going to bet you anything that this slide down here is rice starch. Rice starch just happens to have incredibly tiny starch particles, and they are also incredibly round. And you can see the spherical shape of those granules. In other cases, the starch granules are very large and more oval in shape. And in some cases, they are, under a microscope, they look exploded. And that implies that they have been gelatinized. We'll talk about what gelatinized means. But um, from a product development perspective, this is actually quite, quite fun in that you can take a food sample and inspect it under the microscope and you can find out more about what type of starch structures you're seeing and you can using iodine iodine just happens to um, complex with these helix structures to make a blue color and it uh, depending on depending on the the gelatinization pattern it will either be brown or it will be blue and in the case of these helices, the iodine complex is inside the helix and forms a blue compound. So you can quickly identify and reverse engineer based off of the starches that you have. Let's say you're working in private label. You can quickly uh, identify and um, try running a similar starch from your own, um, from your own inventory to be able to try and copy a formulation. So as I mentioned before, um, boy, this is an old slide. <laughs> we've got these uh, growth rings in starch granules. And so we've got uh, crystalline and amorphous rings within those starch granules. And so what, what does this look like? Well, if you can imagine you've got these long chains of starch where we've got a lot of the amylose residues, they form those crystalline structures. And then we've, we've got more branch chains. They form that amorphous space. And as I said before, different plants within their genetics are capable of making longer alpha chain, or longer, a, um, pardon me, longer um, amylose chains or more amorphous um, amylopectin type branches. And so as we, it, it almost looks like a grapevine. As these branch points form, we get uh, the different either crystalline or amorphous structures within those starch granules. Now, what goes on when we mix starch with water? So more often than not, we are taking starch in our food product and we are adding water and then we're cooking it off. So we've got our native starch. Native, it would be implied that it's in the same form that we're finding it in the plant. We add water and we start to add heat and the starch starts to swell up. The water's interacting in between all those different um, layers. And at a certain temperature, each starch has a different temperature point at which it pastes 
you are going to see that starch paste off and you'll have a rapid thickening of the sample. And this is a this is something that um, many product developers are really curious about. What is the pasting temperature of my starch? Because it implies how much do you need to heat that product? You don't want to add the starch and overheat it because what can happen too is you can overcook the starch and lose some of the integrity of the um, starch gelation. So we've heated it up, we have gelatinization, and we have pasting. So that's where that starch is thickening up and it's becoming really, really viscous. Then, depending on the situation, the starch will form a gel. If it's in a high enough concentration, it will form a gel. And depending on the ratio of amylose versus amylopectin, it can start to reorganize. So more amylose, as I mentioned before, while it is it is it is technically a helix, it packs flat. Those helices can pack together very efficiently, whereas if it's very high in amylopectin, they do not pack back efficiently. The branch points lend for a lot of disorganization. It's sort of like trying to stack logs on a pile versus stacking uh, twigs and branches. Twigs and branches don't stack neatly, whereas logs, you can make a nice wood pile. Think amylopectin is big, um, big branches with all sorts of branch points. They do not stack tidy. Amylose will stack tidy into neat piles. And so high amylose starches are going to retrograde. They're going to um, ex exhibit cineresis and they're going to have poor uh, storage and freeze-thaw capabilities. Amylopectin gels have better capabilities and do not retrograde as well. Now, how on earth do we measure this? Well, if you're in a bootstrapping situation, you can use a water bath and you can, uh, using either a sous vide machine or um, just a good old thermometer and a water bath, you can, you can track and find out where your pasting temperature is on your starch. In some labs, they will use what's called rapid viscoamylographs. And this is uh, also called the RVA. And that's where you're taking a starch sample in a canister here and there's a little tiny propeller blade inside, and it's measuring the viscosity over time and at a changing temperature. So what we've got here is a temperature profile. Oops, pardon me. Temperature profile is going up, 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 starting at 50 degrees and going up to 90 degrees. And so we're seeing that pasting temperature here at, a, um, where are we at, 80 degrees. So we see a peak viscosity at 80 degrees. And then on additional heating and stirring, we get a, a decrease in viscosity. We, so we've, we've had that peak viscosity, and then we're starting to break down the starch as we're continuing to heat it and continuing to agitate it. And then on cooling, we start to see that gel formation. So this is a really useful tool. Now, not all food product development uh, teams have access to this. And so, again, a lot of it's outcomes basis. You can ask your starch supplier, do you have a viscoamylograph um, a diagram showing the pasting properties? Or can you tell me the, the peak viscosity uh, temperature, the pasting temperature for my starch, so that you can understand this better? You can also just do it from an outcomes basis. We've talked about the fact that you can call up different ingredient suppliers and ask for a sample. If you are in a product development team, that's very, very common to have a relationship with some of the different ingredient suppliers and they know that you are going to be doing R&D and they'll, um, generally if you've got a good relationship with them, they'll send you out samples of um, a couple kilos or maybe a bag of the different products so that you can trial it. I think we talked about fiber in the previous slideshow, and so I'm going to uh, jump ahead on this. But fiber, honestly, it's something that, um, from a product development perspective, is so interesting because most people in North America do not get enough dietary fiber, despite the fact that there's all of this promotion saying eat more fruits and vegetables, eat whole grains, and so on. We don't get enough dietary fiber um, on a population basis, and as such, 
it's a major public health concern. Um, starch can act like fiber, and this is interesting. When starch is in plant sources, in many cases, it is re it's naturally resistant. Some starches are what are called RS1 starches, and they are physically inaccessible because they're within unprocessed grains and seeds. And um, I'm sure you, <laughs> pardon, pardon me, this, this, my, my, my teenage kid will be embarrassed when I say this, but I'm sure you have eaten foods and then when you visit the washroom, you can see the food uh, in a semi-intact form in your feces. That is a sign of inaccessibility within the digestive process. Not all foods are digested equally and evenly. And some starches are in physically inaccessible forms within seeds and legumes. And so that is a means of resistant starch. And this, this is where there's some controversy from labeling perspective. Do you have to label it if, if it's never going to be digested? Um, the current basis is absolutely because we're basing our nutrition facts tables on proximate analysis, not on digestibility. Here's another one. Um, RS2 starch shows up in a granular form in certain um, immature plants. So uncooked potatoes, green bananas, these um, high amylose corn, these have RS2 type starch. It's a naturally occurring isolated starch, but it's a resistant starch and it, it acts like dietary fiber. You can't digest it. It can bulk out food products. And so green banana flour has had a real um, interest within the keto food um, segment because it's not digested, but it acts like a starch from a formulation perspective. RS3 starch is where you take uh, normal starch, you cook it off, and then you retrograde it. And so heat it and cool it. Um, in the case of cornflakes and some types of breads in the crusts of these um, products, much of the starch is retrograded and therefore um, not as accessible um, and readily accessible. It takes more time for that starch to release. Last but not least, you can chemically modify starches so that they resist digestion. And these are not found in nature, but uh, they are available from different suppliers. It's more common because of clean label requirements on so many products that uh, consumers are demanding to be sourcing starches from these other forms. Now, um, one reason that starch has such a uh, bad reputation and carbohydrates in a bad reputation is because of the implications of carbohydrates within the, um, the role of many of the different chronic diseases that are occurring in, in um, industrialized societies. So honestly, one of the most common diseases in Canada that's diet related is uh, type 2 diabetes. Um, type 2 diabetes, as you know, comes from overconsumption of uh, free glucose. This can come from um, either just overconsuming sweets, over consuming food, period. Um, it can also come from not giving your body sufficient fasting periods in between meals. Part of it comes from lack of exercise and physical activity. Your body has insulin and the insulin acts as a as a, a sort of like a key to open up the cellular structure and allow sugar to enter. If your body is constantly flooded with glucose, the insulin key that which opens up the cells, the cells start saying, you know what, I don't need any more glucose. I've got enough glucose. Thank you very much. And they lock the door. And the insulin ceases to be functioning properly. So what's the implication from a food product development perspective? Um, a lot of food product developers, um, more so about 10 years ago, but it's still very interesting because of the role of keto diets and um, low carbohydrate diets in healthy wellness um, dietary planning. The glycemic index of a food product is still of very high interest. And it's something that's a bit challenging for food product developers to consider. And so you have to either think about it more from an abstract perspective or pay a not small sum of money to be able to evaluate it. The challenge is you can't make any health claims against it. 
you can you can t you can talk in abstract terms, but you can't make a health claim about the glycemic index of a food product, and we'll talk about why. But um, how do we measure glycemic index? The uh, the the implication is if you were to eat that food product, how much circulating blood glucose is going to be increasing after you've consumed that product over the first two hours. And it's measured as the area under the curve. And so it's going to be compared against a 50 gram dose of glucose or a 50 gram dose of white bread. And both of those are common expression. Um, 50 gram dose of glucose is very common within a lot of biochemistry um, labs because that 50 gram glucose um, is commonly used for diabetes testing, um, gestational diabetes in pregnant women, and as such, it's incredibly standardized. So the main premise, you would first off do that 50 gram dose of glucose and, and they would measure your area under the curve and assume that is a 100% area under the curve. And then you would eat um, an adjusted food product that's going to deliver 50 grams of carbohydrate and we would also measure the area of, under the curve for the blood glucose levels. Those blood glucose levels could be monitored by having a pick line and taking blood uh, at routine time points along the testing period, or it could be through finger prick testing. It's done a few different ways. Um, it's beyond the scope of what most food companies would be able to do. And don't just go and do finger prick testing by going and buying a finger prick meter at the drugstore. Um, there's a lot of different risk activities that need to be done uh, with respect to that. You can't just go and prick people's fingers and test glycemic index. There's a lot of ethical and safety considerations that need to be taken place. So please do not just go and do it. Um, so just a quick summary, different food products have different glycemic indexes um, compared to that uh, standard bolus of of products. So cornflakes, high glycemic index, all brand. What reduces glycemic index? The challenge is very few people eat these foods in isolation. And so, for example, if you're having cornflakes, you're likely having milk with it. If you're having milk with it, maybe you're having coffee with it. Maybe you're having a piece of fruit with it. If you are having spaghetti, are you having some protein with it? it all of these change your gastric emptying rate. And depending on the circumstances, you could be also increasing the amount of dietary fiber within there, which is going to reduce the gastric emptying rate. Very few of these products are eaten in isolation. And so there are things that can increase your glycemic index as compared to the product alone, or things that can decrease your glycemic index as compared to the product alone. And that's why Health Canada has been extremely resistant of allowing glycemic index as a means of marketing your food product. So food companies will talk about it and they'll talk about it in sort of indirect ways, but they can't go out and say, this product has this glycemic index, or you can't go out and say, this product has a low glycemic index. You can think about it contextually, you can formulate for low carbohydrate foods or low glycemic index foods, but you can't go out and use it as a market claim. That's something that's really worth noting. Given the, uh, given the important role that uh, low carb and keto diets have had in North America in the past decade or so, it is worth really seriously con contemplating this, but don't use it as a market claim. Oh, we mentioned this uh, a few times already, so I'm going to just move along quickly here, but how are most carbohydrates analyzed? Honestly, it's by difference. And the methodology for actually measuring carbohydrates is quite complex. Dietary fiber, you can apply a variety of different enzyme cocktails and then have the fiber, the neutral fiber or detergent fiber extract that allows for fiber, estima fiber estimation. But in general, in general, carbohydrate on an NFT is measured by difference. And that's important to note. So what, what I, I want to leave you with is that carbohydrates are likely one of the most important macronutrients in our food system. But at the same time, we 
don't do them enough justice. And I think it's worth a very serious consideration of what they can do for us and be very, very deliberate when formulating with respect to carbohydrates. I think that's it. Yeah, it is. All right. That's a lot about carbohydrates. I have more slideshows to prepare for you, but I'll leave you with that. Take care. Send me your questions and we'll talk to you soon.